Well, good evening. Good evening, guys. Lovely to see you all. Thank you for making the effort to come out this evening. It's uh, yeah, really appreciated. We're going to be in the book of Romans this evening. So if you've got a, a Bible with you, uh, if you could turn to Romans chapter 8. Uh, you'll need to keep your finger in that for the, uh, for the rest of the evening. But we're going to be in Romans chapter 8. My voice sounds very tinny through this microphone, doesn't it? Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> there we go. As long as we know it's the microphone, not me. <laughs> oh. But yeah, it's lovely to see you. Well, shall we pray before we, uh, before we get into the evening? Dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for the uh, privilege this evening to be able to meet together as a group of believers to worship you, to spend time glorifying you for who you are and what you've done. Lord, we pray that you would meet us this evening, that you would speak to us, that you would open our hearts so that we can receive your word and Lord, that we would go away changed. Lord, I, I pray now that you would you speak into this room. Let your Holy Spirit fall in your mighty name. Amen. 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 So yes, we're going to be in Romans chapter 8. going to pick up from where I left off in January. So we are going to start at verse 18. I'm just going to read it through now and then we're going to worship and then I'll come back and explore it a bit later in the evening. So Romans chapter 8, verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grow inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans, and he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be confirmed, conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among, among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who can bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? For it is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't that just an incredibly rich passage? It's no wonder, really, that some people have said that Romans 8 is possibly the best chapter in the Bible. It is incredibly rich, and it's going to be a privilege to go through it a bit later on in the service. But shall we respond in worship now? I'll hand over to John. Yeah, let's stand together as we sing some praises to his name. <laughs> Thank 
I want to praise the God that you be all as James speaks. Tonight, the central theme, really, of the message is a weighty one. We're going to be dealing with suffering. And I know when I look around the room that that is a very real thing for many of us, if not all of us in this room, the idea of suffering. Because we do live in a world that is broken. We live in a world that is full of sickness, a world that's full of death. We can't escape it. It's everywhere around us. And for some people, for many people, it can be a real stumbling block to their faith in God. How can a good God allow suffering? Perhaps he's not even good at all. Perhaps he is asleep at the wheel. Is he truly good? Well, I've had this conversation so many times. My response would probably be threefold. And I would firstly start by saying that God's original creation was perfect. In Genesis 1 verse 31, it said God saw all that he had made and it was very good. God's original creation was perfect, but suffering, pain and death came as a consequence of the fall. So the world that we live in, this broken world that we're in now, is all down to our rebellion against God. But lastly, one day God is going to be making all things new and all of the effects of the fall will be undone. And there'll be no more pain, no more sickness, no more death. We have that day to look forward to, but we're not there yet. And we see some real insights to this in Romans 8. Let's just start at verse 18. It says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us or to us, depending on the translation. And there is this huge emphasis on suffering in this passage. And Paul knows how hard life can be. And what he wants us to do is to look forward to that day when we do see Jesus face to face, when we are glorified in his presence, but not just for the sake of looking forward. We shouldn't just be people who are so looking forward that we forget that we're in the present. No, he wants to ground us in the present that we're in at the moment, in the here and now. We do look forward to that day when we see Christ face to face, But we do that to help us in the struggles that we're in right now. I think of an athlete, perhaps. Think of the athlete who is training for the gold medal. Every day they are working hard, but they have that single focus, that day where one day they will receive the gold medal and the glory that that will receive. But they look forward to that gold medal so that they get up in the morning, so that they run their race, so that they do their training, so that they keep on going. And here Paul is saying that our present sufferings are not even comparable to the glory that we will experience in the future. Got to remember who's writing this. This is the Apostle Paul writing. And if anyone knows anything about suffering, about pain and about hardship, Paul does. Paul knows exactly what it is to suffer. We think of all the things that Paul experienced in his life. He was shipwrecked. He was flogged. He experienced hunger and thirst. He was whipped and flogged and he had this unknown fawn in the flesh that he suffered with all his life. And ultimately he would be martyred for his faith. Paul is a guy who knows what it is to experience suffering, to live in a broken world. But here he is saying that our present sufferings are not even comparable to that future glory. And this isn't just limited to the persecutions for being a Christian. I think if we look at the context of the passage, this is about the everyday suffering that we experience, sickness, death, hardships in our day-to-day lives, all these unfortunate consequences of the fall. And what he's saying here is it's not like our suffering now, for every hour of suffering, there'll be an hour of good times in the life to come. It's not one-to-one. It's not even comparable, he says. Every single one of us goes through suffering. I myself have been through lots. There's... It's unbelievably hard at times, isn't it? When we go through these things, this world is broken. It is full of natural disasters. It's full of cancer. It's full of death and sorrow. And Paul is not saying that our suffering is small. We mustn't misunderstand him here. He's not saying that our suffering is small. 
But what he's saying is in comparison to the weight of glory that awaits us, we can view it as almost insignificant. But he's not saying it's small. He knows how incredibly tough it is. And I think the reason we sometimes don't quite get this is because we cannot comprehend how incredible eternity is going to be. No, it's not that our suffering is small, it's how incredible that future hope is. Verse 19. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. I love this next bit. In hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. So what Paul's getting at here is, uh, he's referring to the natural creation as well. So not just uh, human beings, but actually the natural creation, all the world that is around us. Everything that's under the dominion of man, so animals, uh, birds, the rivers, the oceans, the trees. This creation has also been subjected to frustration. We look around and we see that. We see natural disasters. We see death and decay, even in the natural world. You have to watch one of those David Attenborough documentaries to see it. We live in a world that is broken. Even the natural world around us is broken. But we also see glimpses when we look at the natural world of how it was meant to be and how one day it will be even better. When we look out and see the night sky at night, how beautiful it is. When we look at a sunset over the ocean, when we look at the grandeur of the Grand Canyon, and you could carry on this list all evening, but this creation is groaning. It's groaning, it's deliberately dramatic language here. It's groaning for that day when everything will be made new, when this new creation will come in, when the children of God will be revealed, when the full measure of our redemption is exposed. In the present age, the children of God have not yet been fully revealed. Now, I was, this is a bit of a strange one. I was walking down the high street in Neath on my lunch break this week, and I was playing a little random game with myself. I was trying to spot, is that person a Christian? Is that person a Christian? <laughs> Couldn't do it. At the moment, until we actually sit down and talk to people, we don't know who the children of God are, but there will be a day when we will shine like the stars, when you won't be able to miss who the children of God are. We will be fully revealed when there's that separation like the sheep and the goats. We will be seen as we are meant to be seen. But this creation was subjected to frustration. This creation is broken, not by its own choice, it says. You know, it didn't choose it to be this way, but by the will of the one who subjected it. So this frustration and decay is a consequence of the fall of our sin, but the curse is ultimately from God. We do see this in scripture. Have a look at Genesis 3, 17 to 19, where we see the curse. It's a consequence of our sin, but it is ultimately a curse from God. But he did not subject creation without hope. We see this so clearly in the passage, without hope. And we look at the issues of the world today. We see things like climate change. And I am all for Christians and other people in this world doing everything that we can to minimise climate change, to look after the planet that we live in. We should. But ultimately, only God can restore this broken planet. We should be doing all that we can to save it, to be stewards of this world. But only God can ultimately restore this planet that is broken. We do see the incredible hope for our broken world that one day creation itself will be liberated from the frustration it currently experiences. When we die, we're not just going to be spiritual beings floating around in the air. There is going to be a new creation. This world is going to be made and built back better than it was before. We are going to have physical bodies to enjoy a physical creation, a world that is being made new. And Paul likens this groaning that creation is experiencing to that of the pains of childbirth. Now, I can't specifically relate to this. I've been told it's like being kicked in the private area, but I, I can't verify for that. But when we think of childbirth, when we think of childbirth, we think of pain, we think of suffering, we think of anguish, but with a purpose. 
you know, people don't go through childbirth just for the sake of the pain. It's because of the new life that will come at the end of it, of the joy that that will bring. So creation is groaning in the pains of childbirth because it's looking forward to that day when the new life will come. There is that beautiful gift at the end, the birth of a child, this new creation. And creation is groaning, but not in absolute despair, but with the future hope where this creation will be restored. Ever since Adam and Eve and the fall, there's been this curse on the ground. But one day that curse will be gone. We see that in Revelation 22. And we will live in that new earth that God is making. This pain that we're in right now is temporary. We have that eternal hope to look forward to. And I'm going to give you a quote here. It's not from the Bible. It's from Samwise Gamgee. Do we know Samwise Gamgee? The Hobbit. Yeah. Now, in The Lord of the Rings, there is so much pain and suffering. Right until the very end, it looks like it's doom and despair all the way through. But listen to what he writes. But in the end, it is only a passing thing, this shadow. Even darkness must pass. A new day will come. And when the sun shines, it will shine out the clearer. The folk in those stories had lots of chances to turn back, only they didn't. They kept going because they were holding on to something. I wish I could do that with the accent that he uses. It would be much more powerful. But it's an incredible little quote, isn't it? When the sun shines, it will shine out the clearer. Let's just read on in our passage, verse 23. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, <coughs> the redemption of our bodies. So we've looked at creation is groaning. The natural world around us is groaning because of the consequences of the fall. But we are groaning. We are waiting for this world to be made new, for our bodies to be made new. We are inwardly groaning, longing for that day to come. Do you find yourself longing for that day when Christ will make all things new? We should be. We should be people that groan, that long for that day. For this world is not as it should be. And we are groaning for this new creation for two things, and we're going to look at them. Firstly, our perfected new bodies and our full adoption to sonship. We're going to have a look at each of those. So there's two things. Let's have a look at them one by one. Firstly, let's look at our full adoption to sonship. So at the very end of the passage last time, we looked at the fact that we are sons and daughters of the king. We are children of God. And we are already children of God in one sense. And there is a future aspect of that to come as well. There is a sense in which we are still waiting for our full adoption. And that's what causes the groans within us, because we're waiting for that full adoption into sonship. And what Paul is showing us here is that our redemption doesn't happen all at once. We're saved. We don't go straight to heaven. We have this time in between. And if you jump forward a little bit to verses 29 and 30, we kind of see the order of this as it takes place. So verse 29, it says, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be confirmed to the conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. We see the stages involved there. Now, I'm not going to go into the controversies of these verses. These can be particularly controversial at times, especially words like foreknew, predestined, those kind of words. I don't think that's the main thrust of what Paul is actually trying to get at in, in this. But what it does tell us is that if you are a Christian here this evening, it didn't happen by accident. That God has called you out of the darkness and you have responded to the gospel. But God's plan for salvation began before the foundations of the world. Of the world and he is faithful to his word. Notice it's not some of those that he called he will justify and those, some of those he justifies he will glorify. It's those he called he justifies. Those he justified will be glorified. It, it, it's going to happen. God keeps his words. That's what this is getting at. There's a faithfulness to it. So when we become a Christian, when we give our lives to Jesus, we are justified. And what that means is our legal status 
changes before God. Our sin no longer condemns us, but we stand a new creation before God. We are declared innocent. Our sins are nailed to the cross, so we bear them no more. And then we are adopted as sons and daughters of the King. But we still struggle, don't we? This life is hard. We struggle with our battles with sin. We struggle with the consequences of the fall in this life. But in sanctification, this little time period now, before we see Jesus face to face, we start to become more like him. He helps us to grow, to change, so we become more like our king. So our adoption is complete. We are sons and daughters of the king, but it's also not yet complete. There is a huge promise, though, that those he has justified, if you're here and you're a Christian, you have been justified. He will glorify. Those he, have, he has justified, he will glorify. And when we are glorified, there will be no more sickness, no more death, no more pain. What we're in at the moment is the now but not yet now era of the kingdom, where some of the kingdom promises have come in, but not yet all of them. We're not living in the fullness of the kingdom just yet. We're in that now but not yet now period. But we do have this incredible promise that those he has justified, he will glorify. So we are eagerly awaiting, we are groaning for our full adoption to sonship. But also we see that we are groaning. The second thing that we are longing for is the redemption of our bodies. We wake up in the morning and we've got that bad back. We wake up and our knees are giving us pain. Our bodies are frail and they are prone to aging, sickness and death. And every single one of us, unless the Lord Jesus returns first, will taste death, whether that's in a week or whether it's in 10 years or 50 years. We will all die unless Christ returns first. And death is a consequence of the fall. And it's part of that curse that is mentioned in Genesis 3. And in that moment in death, what will happen is our body and our soul will separate. Our body will stay here to decay, to go into the ground. And our soul will go to be with the Lord. This is the intermediate state before soul and body get reunited at the second coming of Christ. And it is not good for that separation to take place. We see that in scripture, that it's not good for body and soul to be separated. But what this passage says is that we are going to be united. There will be that un unity again of body and soul. The redemption of our bodies. God intended our souls to be united with our bodies, but death gets in the way of that. But it won't be our current bodies as we know them now. We will have these incredible resurrection bodies. There's so much that we could say, but it was said really well a, a few weeks ago on the Sunday morning service. But we're going to have this continuity with our current bodies, but also there's going to be this incredible newness, this incredibleness of the new body. Paul uses the image of a seed that goes into the ground when he talks about it. And this seed, out of the seed comes an incredible plant that's still somehow linked to the original seed, but in many ways it's nothing like it. It's going to be incredible. We could spend so long discussing that. But in these redeemed bodies that God has promised, soul and body will be united as they were meant to be, and we will be able to enjoy God's renewed creation for all eternity. So we are longing after that day when our new bodies and soul will be forever in the presence of God. And in verse 24 says that for in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. So this is really interesting. It says, for this hope we were saved. When we think of our salvation, it's past, present and future, isn't it? We were saved the day we gave our lives to Jesus. We are being saved as we become more like Christ, as we become sanctified. But ultimately there is a future aspect of our salvation as well, when we do see him face to face and we will be like him. And Paul here uses the word hope. For in this hope we were saved. Now, we often get the word hope wrong. I, I, I really, really hope that we don't burn the soup tonight, because that got me in a lot of trouble in the first one. I hope that doesn't happen again. How do you burn soup? I've no idea. <laughs> but I really hope that we don't burn the soup tonight. But it might happen. As a, 
awning there for whoever's heating up the soup in a minute. But it might happen. I hope that Arsenal win the league this season. I really hope that Arsenal win the league this season. But it might not happen. It probably won't. Who knows? That's not biblical hope. Biblical hope implies certainty and assuredness. The word here is actually, um, there's a word in, I'm jumping ahead of myself actually, in Hebrews 11 where it talks about our confidence. It uses a Greek word called hypostasis, which means concretely. Now, if you think of what concrete is, if you nail something in with concrete, it's not going anywhere. It's fixed. It's certainly going to stay where it is. We need to have that concrete hope in the gospel. So when you think of the gospel, when you think of the good news of Jesus, what sort of hope do you have in it? Do you kind of hope that it's true? Do you hope that it's true, that it's all just, you know, I, I really hope the gospel isn't good, true, because that would be incredible if it is. Or do you have that hope, that assuredness, that certainty that it is true? Biblical hope is not trivial, but we have an incredible hope. We have that incredible certainty. That's what we need to have, that certainty as to our eternal home. But we sometimes doubt this future hope, don't we? When we think of what is to come, when we look at the incredible uh, words here that Paul uses, do we sometimes doubt this future hope? Does it ever feel like it's too good to be true? When we read passages about what is to come, do we just sometimes think, oh, that's too good to be true? Why would someone give that to me? We are very cynical of good things. Everyone is very cynical of things. We don't trust things, do we? But actually, Paul is reminding us to look back and see what Christ has already done. We're going to see this in the passage. What Paul wants us to do is to look back, to trust Christ for what he's already done. And if he's already done that for us, why will he not also give us all things? We're going to see that in a second. How can we doubt God's promises when he's already given us his son on the cross? Listen to verse 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? So what he's saying here is, look, if you don't trust me, look at what I've already done in the past, giving you my son to die on the cross to purchase your justification. I've already given you everything that I can. Of course I'm going to give you your future hope. How will he not also, along with him, that is Christ, graciously give us all things? So who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? For it is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of the Father and is also interceding for us. So Paul's basically saying here, God was willing to sacrifice his own son to purchase our redemption. He was prepared to give everything for us. When we look at the cross, when we see all that it achieved, we can trust him. He's already given him us. He's given us the best gift that we could possibly have. And he will certainly secure our glorification. He's saying, look at the cross. Jesus laying down his own life to purchase our salvation, to redeem us from the curse of the law, to redeem us from the curse of sin, so that it no longer holds us anymore. He has already given us the most costly gift that he could. There's nothing more that God could give. And as a consequence, we are eternally secure in God's hands. We are eternally secure. Our eternity is secure because of Christ. Just listen to the end of this. The end of the passage, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who shall separate us? Should it be trouble? hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger or sword, these are all things that Paul would have experienced. As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And 38 is incredible, 38 and 39. I am convinced, Paul is utterly convinced here, that neither death nor life Neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. 
so rich, so, so beautiful. But if we are a Christian, if we are saved, then nothing can separate us from the love of God, not even death. We often have this wrong picture of death, but death is just a change of address. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Not death, not suffering, not anything else in this creation can separate us from the love of God. And as I try and bring this into close, into close, I've just got three points for us to take away from this passage. There are so many more that we could pull out. There's a, it's so rich. But firstly, our suffering is temporary and not worth comparing to our future hope. That's the first point. Secondly, God works all things for the good of those who love him. And lastly, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Those are the three take home points. Let's just look at them one at a time as we close. Firstly, our suffering is temporary and not worth comparing to our future hope. As we've already said, we live in this broken world. Every single one of us will experience pain, suffering, even death. And being a Christian does not exempt us from this. We are in this broken world and we experience that suffering just like everyone else. But this chapter shows us that our present sufferings and tribulations are not even worth comparing to that future hope, to that future <clears throat> glory. Paul isn't belittling our suffering. He's not making it seem small and insignificant. He knows how painful it is. Even Jesus himself suffered beyond anyone else on the cross and in the events running up to. He knew what it was to suffer. <clears throat> but Jesus saw ahead to the joy that was set before him. So he could endure the cross. So when Jesus was looking at the cross square on, he was looking beyond the cross to the joy that was set before him. So he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and is now sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So we look ahead to the renewal of creation in our heavenly bodies. And our future hope is grounded. It is concrete because of what Christ has already done. He's given us the best that he can. He certainly will give us all things. And this hope isn't just for the future. We are promised help in the present as well. It's not that we just have to keep looking forward and not be, not, we're still in these situations that we're in. There's actually hope for the present. Look at verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. In our weakness, in our struggles with sin, the Holy Spirit, who is dwelling within the believer, helps us in our battles. We do struggle in this broken world. The pain sometimes is horrific. When we grieve, when we deal with sickness, whatever it is that we're going for, but we are promised hope. God gives us his Holy Spirit to help us in our weakness. <clears throat> And that leads me on to the second point, that God works all things for the good of those who love him. Now, this is the fridge magnet verse. This is the one that everyone loves to have on their, on their fridge magnets, or it's the one that people highlight. God working all things for the good of those who love him. It's a really encouraging verse in our pain and our suffering. God can take any situation that we are in, any amount of suffering, any amount of pain, and work it for our good whether it's that period of grief, whether it's the sickness, whether it's the cancer, God can turn all things for our good. But we often misapply this verse. I think the main problem is that we think that we know what is best for us. It talks about for our good. We sometimes think that we know better than God. So when it says God works for the good of those who love him, we think that God works according to our will alone, as if he's just going to do what we think is best. But we have to trust when we're in those circumstances that God knows best, that he has the big picture, that he has that plan. God has infinite knowledge and infinite wisdom, and we have to trust that when we are in our circumstances, that he is working, that he has that plan in mind, that he has full control, even in the midst of our suffering, and he can turn our suffering into good and for his glory. Do we believe this? Do we believe that God can work our suffering for our good and for his glory? 
And lastly, as I've said, nothing can separate us from the love of God. I just want to close by reading those verses again from verse 35 onwards. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Is it trouble? Is it hardship? Is it persecution? Famine? Nakedness? Danger? Sword? So many different things. Can any of them separate us from God's love? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I am convinced that neither death nor life, angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Shall we pray together? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that even when we're experiencing hardships, even when we're experiencing suffering, even when we're going through the pains of this life, we trust that you are in full control and that you are working in our circumstances and that you can turn things that seem horrific and work them so that they are for our good and for your glory. We thank you for that. Lord, we do live in this broken world, this world that is dealing with the consequences of the fall and will continue to do so until you come again to make all things new. This creation groans out, our bodies, our souls groan out for the day when the children of God will be revealed. We're not yet revealed, but one day that light bulb will come on. We will be known, we will be seen as we were meant to be seen. And on that day, you will make all things new. Oh, we thank you and we praise you. We long, we groan for that day, but we know that we're still here in the present, that we're still here in our suffering, in our pain. But we trust that with your Holy Spirit in us, that you will help us, that you will give us that eternal hope, that eternal glory to look forward to. And it will motivate us in the present. Lord, I pray if there's people in this room this evening that are struggling with the things that we've been discussing, with the pain, with the suffering that this life brings. Lord, we know that you, you comfort those who mourn. You put your arm around those who are in need. Lord, I pray that you would touch people in this room if they are in need of your touch this evening. As we go through life, which can be so difficult, so challenging, we know that you are there. And we know that you will never forsake us. Not even death can separate us from the love of God. No hardship, no suffering, no amount of pain can take us out of your hand. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you that that is all because of the Lord Jesus who died on the cross to take away all of our pain, all of our sin, all of our suffering, that one day he will redeem us fully we're in that time now where we are children of God but we're not yet fully children of God we haven't fully gone into that life and we long for it we we groan for it but we know it is to come we have certainty because there's concreteness and it's all because of what Jesus did on the cross when he died in our place taking away our sins so that we are now justified and those that he justified he will glorify oh lord we thank you and we praise you in your mighty name amen, amen. <laughs>